So welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. I think we've probably got all time zones of the world. Um, so I'm Bledin Rees. I'm the chair of the Digital Health Society and the deputy chair of the ECH Alliance. Uh, I'm delighted uh, that uh, so many people have been able to join us from different parts of the world. Um, I'm sure that most of you know that we're a, a not-for-profit organization and in a way that pharma tech and med tech are global. Healthcare is at best national, often regional. So we keep uh, reinventing the wheel, not transferring best practice from place to place. So um, one of our purposes is to transform healthcare through our ecosystem network, which uh, Andy will talk about. Uh, and the idea being to bring best practice across borders and to transform healthcare. Uh, so tonight, it's very much about um, healthy aging, and uh, I'll let Andy explain a little bit more about that. But also, finally, from me, welcome to all of our members who are on this call as well. We're very grateful for all of the time you're uh, giving up, and I hope um, that you enjoy uh, and learn something from uh, the next uh, 90 minutes. So thank you very much. Andy. Thank you for that, Bledin. I've got the envious task of both presenting, but also keeping an eye on the door to make sure people can come in and say hello. So welcome all of you, and thank you for taking your time out. Uh, my name is Andy Bleeden. I'm the director here for our communities at the East Age Alliance. What I thought I'd do very, very briefly, I've also put in the chat function here, um, you just pop in your email address, your organisation, and any LinkedIn connections help us make some connections. We're a connector. That's what we do. Um, as Bledin's made very clear there, we're a member organization. We've been around for over 13, nearly 14 years now. Um, we do those things you can see on the screen in front of you. Um, we're as a member organization. We're here to connect, convene, amplify, and accelerate uh, the work of our members. And we bring them together in a network of ecosystems. Many of you are involved with ecosystems over the globe. Um, some of those are in our network, some of them aren't. Um, but we're here today to talk about how we can bring those together under a theme of healthy aging, uh, which we'll get onto in a moment. The idea being that we can then amplify that best practice and, and learning from across the globe and bring it together in an ecosystem, but a global one. We see ecosystems as being very basic uh, ways of bringing communities of stakeholders together in permanent gatherings to match need and solution in a variety of different scenarios and settings, whether it's to do with diabetes, false prevention, dementia, mental health, women's health, or even on subjects such as data and AI. Those are great ways to bring together all of those stakeholders, be it patient and citizen through the company, to break down silos that we know exist in healthcare and have been around since I've been in healthcare over 35 years, but also to transform healthcare, to do something. Because without that, we're, we're just another talking shop. And lastly, we're there also there to transform healthcare, but also create economic opportunity. Because if your largest area of spend is on health and social care, uh, instead of seeing it as a burden, see it as an opportunity. And again, in the, in the field of healthy aging and longevity, why wouldn't we see that as an opportunity? We've spread and grown this network of ecosystems from the first one that I joined in Manchester in the UK over 13 years ago, where I met a much younger uh, Leather Reese and I was much younger then too, to grow to a network of over 80 across the globe um, in countries as diverse as Argentina, Zimbabwe, and Australia. Many of those countries are here today, and I'm pleased to say we should bring more uh, with different time zones that are a bit friendlier than this one uh, from Africa and India, where we can too. But the idea of that network is we can then collaborate and learn and share best practice and match not just from one region, one country, but one continent to another uh, across a wide different range of, of areas. We've also then lastly used that network to build a network of what we see as the thematic ecosystem, which instead of being vertical uh, and country focused are indeed horizontal and focused then on different thematic areas. And we've done those over a number of years on skills in digital health, mental health, continents, but this year we're prioritizing four areas, women's health, green health, 
digital health and data. And lastly, and the reason why we're all here today on healthy aging, because many of us have been involved with this work for decades. Um, and we've seen, as Bledin said, there are constant reinvention of the wheel as people try to d develop a brand new system to, to cope with their ever aging populations. If it's brand new, instead of learning from some of the best practice, whether it be in Australia or Scotland or in the US or Africa or across Europe or in India. So our ideas behind this thematic ecosystem is to look at the area of where we can look at the area around longevity and see where can we bring in the value of digital health and learn from those people who've got it right, but also learn from those people who haven't and understand what it, what it takes to turn failure into success. So today is a kickoff for that thematic ecosystem where we can bring in our members and our partners we've got across the globe to ask for your contributions, to, to ask for your ideas about what those priorities should be for those first meetings as we start to establish them. Rather than kick off on a topic as we've done previously, we're desperate to hear from you who we know have got existing, again, decades of, of good practice and ideas, what you think some of those ideas are and what, what, what priorities you think we should focus on in the coming years as we build this worldwide approach to healthy aging. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now because I wanna make sure I can hear um, some of your priorities. But first, John, over to you. And uh... So thanks, Andy. Um, I, don't, I'm, I don't I don't wanna get in the way of other people inputting it. I think we do want the input from the group, but let me add a couple of things that haven't been said, at least too explicitly. I, I think this is a, an exploration meeting. So we expect this group to swell quite considerably but we've deliberately kept this one relatively small because we know it almost wouldn't matter what the topic is in healthcare. Um, we have a number of choices in terms of where we focus our time and attention. Healthy aging is a gigantic topic, as would be digital and data, as would be any of those other 11 uh, thematic things that you saw. Um, what's different in terms of what we're trying to do here, I think, is we're starting off with the idea of where does best practice live in the world and within our existing membership or indeed not even within the existing membership of the ECH Alliance, um, but it could be any corner of the world so that we can see where people have demonstrated efficacy in healthy aging um, in whatever that means, um, but also made mistakes in what they're doing and have learned from those mistakes and have closed off certain avenues as, as Andy was hinting. So, I think what we're interested in in this session is to get your input in terms of where to focus our time and attention. You can tell by the framing of this is healthy aging that we're looking at the wellness side of the equation. So we're looking at uh, health span, lifespan, longevity, what leads to that and what are the behaviors that we want to get people to engage in at every level, um, initially perhaps at consumer level. Um, but then also, how do we show up as providers or payers or biopharma um, in terms of supporting that wellness uh, side of the equation? Uh, it's not we're disinterested in the sick care side of this. Uh, older adults, you know, tend to go and command a fair bit of the money we spend. Um, but nonetheless, we want to start with where are the biggest problems, lowest hanging fruit that we're not solving for today, if you like the gaps in the marketplace. And I think the people we've got, even on the call today, have, have represent various parts of that in terms of what they do. There are people in the nonprofit sector. There are people in the academic sector, in payers, in providers, uh, in advocacy organizations uh, up here on the call, for example, today um, that have got you know, this deep, rich database of the older adults that they serve. So I think we're trying to share data. And as Andy said, on an international level, but we don't want to frame up uh, the menu of things that we discuss topic by topic. Uh, we want to do it the other way around and let the group that comes together frame the initial MVP, if you like, if we think of it as a, as a startup, this ecosystem, so that we can, um, we can put flesh on those bones or even change it later. Um, what we'll do, and Andy will come back to this later, is you know, I think officially we will launch this healthy aging um, thematic innovation ecosystem at Vive in Los Angeles at the end of uh, February, um, so a month away. 
Um, and by then, I'd like to take some of the input we get today in some of the way we make the announcement. Um, it's why we want your input so much in terms of maybe not duplicating effort that others have uh, have already done work in. And there's fabulous work um, in this, even in this group, just in terms of sums have already happened. Um, so I'm not going to say any more than that. I think it's a very much an open session. And I think, Andy, we want to kind of go around the room and I'll let you steer oh. it. So everyone gets a chance to talk uh, just in terms of, you know, who they are and how they think about this space, healthy aging as a, as a broad topic. Thanks for that, John. And uh, obviously, some, I'm, I'm conscious we've got people who are on planes who, who democratically decided by the rest of their passengers not to speak so as not to wake up the rest of the uh, rest of the plane or, or they've been threatened with being thrown out out of the plane so george you should name him you... andy that's george margellis with his sunglasses on his head or his glasses on his <laughs> head right now sitting on a plane from the middle east back to australia i think right but george we'll let you put your your, your contribution in the chat function um i'd like to come perhaps if i could first to um uh, I'm going to pick pick some random people, and uh, by the way, random means that you're, I can see you in my vision, and that at the moment looks like a Scott Collins from Linkage Launch. Scott, tell us a bit about yourself and uh, what your ideas might be on this. Yeah, thank you, Andy. I had a weird feeling you were going to go in that direction. Um, so Scott Collins with Linkage Launch, uh, as well as a company called Linkage, our real area of focus and domain expertise is in the area of aging, uh, with a particular focus on, on healthy aging. Um, we've got a network of more than 1,000 members that we do a few things for. Uh, we provide contracting and support services for them, so they're all uh, focused in the healthcare and aging space through independent living, assisted, skilled nursing, and so on. We have a market research company that helps people and businesses better understand older consumers. And then we have three private equity funds all uh, geared towards investing in early stage companies with products, services, and technology in the healthcare and aging space. More recently, we created Linkage Launch. John Warner is the chair of our advisory board, and we were proud to join ECH Alliance uh, a little over a year ago, and they've been incredible partners for us. And our goal is to bring about a, a venture studio, leveraging our domain, domain expertise, access to a large distribution network, and working with collaborators from across healthcare, not just post-acute, incorporating also experts and thought leaders from the payer space, as well as policymakers, to build companies that are de-risked and focused on solving real world problems, uh, either directly or indirectly for older adults. That's helpful and a good starter. I'm going and, first. And Andy, Please. let's let's end with this just so so Scott, if you were to pick one area that you would focus on under the aegis of this grand title healthy aging, uh, what would it be for you? Um, as it relates specifically to our aging population in the US and abroad, uh really focused on the social determinants of health and um supportive tools for caregivers, both professional and non-professional or family caregivers. Okay. Helpful. Well, very, very helpful. Thank you. I'm going to turn the attention from, from, from a U.S. market to that in Scotland. Margaret Woriski, are you there? Hi, <laughs> I am here. Um, can you hear me okay? You can indeed. Yeah, um, no, really nice to to connect in with with folk um, across the globe, as you said, Andy. Yeah, so I'm Margaret Horisky. Uh, I've recently moved to uh, a new role within the Digital Health and Care Innovation Centre in Scotland. Um, but uh, for the last sort of twenty years, I have been based in Scottish government, and I guess both, I suppose, shaping policy and strategy, uh, in particular in the last 10 plus years on digital health and care. But I suppose my interest has been primarily in how we support adoption and worked very sort of closely with our health and care providers in Scotland, but also our third sector, independent care sector, housing sector um, colleagues as well in relation to those areas where we feel there is evidence and impact, how can we really support that adoption? We've had some real success in some areas. We've, we've I suppose we continue to have some challenges with how we um, do support that um, scale up. Um, 
even where uh, there is good evidence, is still, I think, in Scotland and I guess elsewhere, I'm sure a lot of optionality around it. COVID did bring a, a different, um, I suppose, context and there was there was more mandatory, I guess, uh, uh, you know opportunities, um, but I think there has been a, a little bit of a reversal. I, I think, and um, we've got a lot of variability across our health providers in Scotland in relation to how they use um, digital. Some areas use it very well. Some areas don't use it so much. So I guess I'm really interested in in that, particularly now in my role with DHI. I suppose in terms of looking at opportunities around innovation and how we can sort of shift you know the the innovation that's coming through into um, adoption and scale up in terms of healthy aging I, I guess a lot of my work has been around supporting independent living um, prevention early intervention we talk a lot about prevention early intervention but yet a lot of the focus continues to be on sort of the more acute presentation um, so I, I think how do we really seriously get uh, the focus on uh, well-being, um, addressing inequalities and, you know, getting more focused on prevention, self-management, early intervention in that sort of ecosystem around the person, you know, their community and uh, you know, the services that that are around. We, we've done some really interesting work with some non statute non non sort of um formal services like library services um they've really pivoted i think in terms of how they see their role around supporting people and again a lot of that will be older people who are using libraries um but moving very much from the traditional role of libraries into areas where they can support people to connect digitally um both for just day-to-day -day interests but also uh, for accessing sort of health and care um, interventions and support. And I guess my other big area of interest has been digital inclusion. Um, again, I think that came into stark focus over during COVID, but we've, we're involved in some interesting work in uh, Scotland around um, housing, homelessness, um, people at risk of, of, uh, of drug deaths, uh, which I know is not quite healthy aging, but obviously it does impact if you, do, if you die early. Um, mm. And certainly in Scotland, we've got the unenviable um, sort of uh, accolade, if you like, of having the highest um, drug deaths uh, in Europe. Um, so, so I guess there's a lot there. Um, I, mm. I'm really keen also that we bring our housing sector into the mm -hmm conversations because people need a place to live. Housing has a huge role to play. Um, and again, we've seen some really interesting innovation around how we can adapt housing opportunities for people as they age, because housing can often be the challenge as people age and end up, at, you know, maybe in receipt of formal care services because the, the housing situation um, is, is not uh, uh, appropriate. Um, so probably wrapped up a lot there, Andy, in terms of well, I, the, my, the, my background reason, and interests. Yeah. There's a reason we've included you, Margaret, because Scotland, I think, is, is one of those countries we always proud to showcase, whether it's the work of the Healthy Aging Innovation Cluster in Scotland, which has been leading the way for a number of years uh, in this field. And the connection you have outside of Scotland with other countries has been uh, demonstrable so there's a good reason why that's important messages from you and i'm pl pleased that we've got that in, uh, membership with you uh with with the healthy aging innovation cluster but also the links with the with the dhi and scottish government too so thanks for that i'm going to move now because i can uh, to charlotte yay from aarp charlotte uh, you're <laughs> wrestling there with all sorts of creatures under the sea yeah, Good to see but, you again. <laughs> um, it's so peaceful down here. <laughs> Anyways, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Charlotte Yeh. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for AARP uh, Services. I am in the business subsidiary of AARP. And as you can imagine, I live and breathe a <laughs> healthy aging uh, every moment of every day. Um, I would say my areas of focus is, uh, I think, first and foremost, we're not gonna change aging and move to healthy aging if we don't change the narrative of aging because there is such embedded in-depth ageism 
where people think of aging as all about decline and forget about the assets that actually come when you age, you know, better experience, better problem solving and better adaptability. So within that new narrative, I would say there are three areas of focus that I have. The first is um, emotional well-being and resilience. We all tend to focus on the heart disease, the diabetes, the obesity, et cetera, but we are underutilizing and undertapping the protective factors of adaptation and resilience. I call, I personally call them our three Ps. P for purpose. If you have a reason to get up in the morning, you have people, people to do it with or to support you. Your possibilities and what you can envision for tomorrow become endless. And we have a number of studies that have been done by academics and researchers that can actually tie purpose, uh, social connection, and um, a positive perception of aging to better health outcomes, lower health care costs, and uh, lower utilization. And it's a way to reduce the quote unquote burden that we see. Um, the third, uh, the third avenue that I like to um, to talk about is in our work that we are doing here at ARP Services. Everyone else goes to the clinician, the provider, to change the consumer behavior. We actually have worked in the Medicare Supplemental Plan where we work with the consumer to change provider behavior. And we can show evidence that by working with the consumer, you can do care management, you can do fall prevention, you can do advanced directives, a whole host of things by learning the language of the person and working that way. And the last, the third, uh, the third area under this healthy aging, uh, which I don't think we pay enough attention to is user design and user experience. You know, we all say, oh, that older person, they just don't have digital literacy. So we're doing the blame the victim. But why mm -hmm. are we not thinking about how do you design so it's simple, so it's easy to use, so people are engaged and want to participate as opposed to um, forcing it and saying, you know, you need to adapt to us. I think we should be thinking about consumer design, co-design. We mm -hmm. should be using consumer feedback to actually improve the products to get that kind of engagement. So that's uh, my area of focus. I'm starting to think out a new kind of framework of where we should focus, you know, on brain health, specific, and particularly in hearing loss, um, safety, privacy, security, and safety, fraud, mobility, in order to get the independence and then caregiving. Um, I think if we can, improve our cognitive function, if we can keep moving and stay active and be mobile, even in a wheelchair, if we can feel safe and we can care for others and be cared for, what else do you need in life? So um, that's my story. Thank you for that, Charlotte. Interesting. So, so Andy, at the, at the risk of uh, overdosing on AARP, we've got Andy Miller yeah, and, Andy. And, and we might want to just deck AARP in the next two sessions too yeah i i have awesome colleagues andy miller and rick robinson on this call as well come on rick it's now now's your chance <laughs> all right great thanks for that um uh i think charlotte really said it very well and what we do at the h tech collaborative from aarp is really support a lot of what she's talking about through action and uh, that action shows up as us finding great startups all over the world um, through a variety of meetings, primarily pitch competitions. Then we invite some of them, a small portion of them, into our accelerator program throughout the year. And then some of those, um, you know, we do make some small investments in some of those. But more importantly, we bring uh, those who graduate into the H Tech Collaborative ecosystem which is, uh, you know, it's approaching 400 participants now. Um, and that's made up of, you know, 130 startup companies plus, you know, many investors and enterprises and testbed organizations. And the goal here, of course, is to bring all these together and to a single platform where they're all able to help one another with the goal of spinning out great modern products that are taking sometimes you know, bleeding edge technology um, and making it available and accessible to uh, the 50 plus market. 
-hmm. And importantly, those who support the 50 plus market. So that could be people of any age. Um, so it's essentially, you know, like I said, finding great companies and helping them succeed to the benefit of, um, of everybody. And that's what we're here to do, to build the biggest ecosystem in the world that's doing this and is focused on this area. Thanks for that, Rick. We're going to take an ARP break and I'm going to head over to <laughs> Australia. But Andy was waiting there all expectant and everything. <laughs> we'll come okay. back to ARP, Andy, very shortly. Ruben. If you can hear me, Ruben. Yes. Good morning, everyone from Australia. Uh, and thank you, Andy. Nice to meet you all. Um, so we, so Sue, Sue Gordon and I, we come from ARIA and we work closely with George Magellis, who's making his way to Australia at the moment. Um, so our mission is to improve uh, the care uh, through the workforce. So empowering the workforce to use uh, innovation, technology and evidence in a very simple manner. Uh, we, we, we particularly have a focus through uh, bringing that evidence through and we have that through, we do that through the website, which is free for all to access. We communicate that to the wider ecosystem. Uh, so whether that be formal and informal carers or general public themselves. Um, so we provide knowledge, evidence-based information for everyone to use. And we also have a training program to then build capability to use the information. We have an uh, incubator program and we give away grants in a nutshell. Um, what's important for us uh, is putting the person at the center of care. Uh, it's person-centered and person-directed. So that's a quick overview of what we do. So did you want to jump in and add more? Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Ruben. Um, I guess um, from my point of view, what we know is there's an awful lot of evidence about what does work that never actually gets adopted, certainly not in a scalable, broad way. We find pockets of very good practice in Australia, but not um, nationwide uptake. Um, and that's part of what we're here to do is to actually give people working in the aged care sector the skills to actually implement um, evidence into practice to innovate. Um, perhaps one of the things Ruben didn't mention is that adoption of technology is one of the things that the government, we are government funded, um, has wanted us to, to really look at. And so we have a number of grants that have been um, awarded for technology adoption. I think in terms of um, missed opportunities around healthy ageing, for me, it's the fact that we don't identify functional decline early enough that pre-frailty is not picked up. And that was my area of research before I actually came into this role. So there's much opportunity to think about what are the changes in the 40 and 50 year olds that actually contribute to um, poor aging um, later on. So thank you. Thanks for that, Sue. Sorry I didn't recognize your, your name. Because that's Sue Gordon, by the way. If those people oh. didn't take out, I've got Gord003, her special code name in Australia. <laughs> your secret right. name, Sue. A bit like 007. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's, 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 it's a slightly cheaper version for, 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 from Australia. <laughs> um, I Andy, can I just add something Please. for the rest of the group on Australia as well? So you can confirm this and Ruben, you too. I, Australia has the enviable position where the government actually spends real money on some mm. fun preventive pro programs. Yep. For example, on advanced care directives, mm -hmm. instead of just mm -hmm. letting people just not do that, the Australian government actually incents people and gives them a mm -hmm. big wad of cash mm -hmm. uh, to, before they get their advanced care directive done. It's just a good example of best practice that is rarely seen in the world. So, so, so am I right? Oh, yes, yeah, certainly the government's had a real push on advanced care directives. We're finding, though, that there's still, um, <clears throat> if, you know, people that go into resident and care facilities, I think the figures are up to about 50% now. So there's still, you know, there's only so much the government can do, isn't there? Um, yeah. But yeah. But yes, John, we are. And, I mean, we're very lucky that we've been funded by the government because mm -hmm. aged care providers just don't have access to what is best evidence. They don't know what is best practice and where do they go to get it. And so that was what Ruben was talking about on our website. We've pulled together all the systematic reviews, the scoping reviews, and, and actually identified what is best practice. Um, so they've got access to it. 
and but having access to the knowledge is one thing actually implementing it as we all know implementing change is actually tough and embedding it in workflows service delivery models um and i think you know we we've got massive workforce shortages which is the other thing that we're seeing globally you know how do you have a workforce that's skilled in the right things to support that healthy aging at all stages of aging um so there's you know if they don't have the skills to manage change and implement and the digital technologies and other technologies to support that it's the only way we are going to be able to in australia continue to deliver safe quality care um and um and so there's that that double-edged knowing what to do having the skills to implement it and having technology that supports that is a really you know important parcel uh, that we're trying to work towards yeah thanks Brilliant. if you get any links that you and Ruben have got especially because you mentioned that lovely word that everyone likes around here hash um put some examples of that program in the chat function we'll be sure to share that as well um i'm just trying to move around tet have we got some contact from you please hey nice to meet you everyone and thanks for having me i yeah my name is Ted Morito from sampo i just launched the new uh, company through the digital platform for the family caregivers and uh, we just launched just april and starting the product this january so it's pretty new and I spent most of time for the corporate debt. But um, my company just started is backed by the Sampo. It's the one of the largest insurance company based in Japan. And they have a uh, footprint across the world, 30, over 30 countries. And property and casualty insurance is the major business is the Sampo over 130 years. But since 2015, so we expand the footprint in the nursing care facilities. Then since, since then, now we have a number one senior care service providers in Japan. And we are providing service for 80,000 residents, users with over 1,000 facilities. And at the same time, as you know, the Japanese super aging society. So we're facing a lot of problem for like a demand and supply gap and for the caregivers and also a lot of like problem on the funding for the government supporting uh, long-term care insurance. So we heavily invested in the technologies to making the operation efficiency at, at the same time, uh, more keep the people I mean, the residents as healthy as possible, like a machine learning and predictive modeling. It's still in the middle of the way, but collecting the data through everything, like a sleeping pattern and nutrition data and everything, and then trying to uh, build up the machine learning or predictive model for the, how the symptom is progress, then well, what happened. So that is the activity all the activities happening in Japan, then at the same time, what about we bring the knowledge expertise in the other company, countries? Then there's a background to build this sample horizon, the new uh, family caregiver digital support, digital platform in the United States. And the regroup supporting family caregivers has a direct impact on the well-being of the aging individual they care for. So the, we're providing the services to the platform, like the shopping on pay bill and everything releasing the family caregivers. And then ultimately it's indirectly or indirectly achieving the healthy aging for the elderly as well as the family caregivers. So that's my focus and that's what I'm doing. And that's my background and maybe why the company, for example, is involved in this new initiative in the United States. So I hope it helps. That's really helpful. <clears throat> Different perspective. Really, really helpful. Okay. Now I'm trying to, I'm gradually trying to move around. Peter, tell us about what you're involved with and what you think are, are, are essential. And then we'll come, we'll come, I think, to you, Michael, and then we'll round it off with Andy. 
I always leave Andy hey. last because I'm Andy. <laughs> so, Peter. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Uh, my name is Peter Caldas. I'm the CEO of Next50. Uh, Next50 is a private national uh, foundation uh, based in Denver, Colorado, in the United States. And uh, we are a relatively young private foundation, being around for about seven years now, but focused on innovation and aging. And so uh, we do grant making and social investing uh, across three priority areas. Uh, the first is around ending ageism. Uh, that has been touched on already in our in our conversation here. Uh, the second is on advancing digital equity, which again has been touched on. Uh, and third is aging in place. Uh, so as you can see, we're we're hyper focused on how we create econo economic opportunity for all of us as we age and really create value to aging. Um, one thing to answer the the sort of question about opportunities. You know, given who we fund, which is primarily um, nonprofits, charities, NGOs, however you call them, wherever you are, uh, we are particularly interested in bridging the gap between uh, places that solely rely on these organizations for healthcare delivery uh, versus um, ignoring them, candidly. Uh, so anywhere, anytime we can lift up our uh, community-based organizations, as we call them here, uh, connecting them with technology, connecting them with resources, making sure that older adults that live in rural areas, for example, which there are a good number of here in the state of Colorado, we always look to connect. Uh, so um, the, that would, connecting folks with uh, those resources that are in their backyard would be one way to promote healthy aging from our perspective. Mm -hmm. Andy, back to you. You're on mute, Andy. That's why Michael's not answering me. Michael! I was trying to... Michael, trying to... Uh... To reform the telepathic link between us, yeah. but it wasn't quite working today. Sorry about that. Tell us what's happening in Canada. Uh, yeah. So hi everyone, Michael Krasowski. I am uh, with AgeWell, um, and AgeWell is a federally funded organization here in Canada that supports research and innovation into technologies benefiting older adults and and caregivers. We've been around for about nine years and. Uh, we have funded a lot of research in space across uh, universities in Canada, uh, supporting their development of, of innovations as well as policies and practices that enable innovations to, to benefit older people. Uh, over the last few years, we've uh, continued to fund research, but we've also increased our support of an involvement in implementation of technologies. So we're involved in a, another national program now where we're looking to support um, small to medium enterprises and getting their innovations into real world settings. So we have funding that can go towards those companies as well as to um, any of their partners that we call community labs that can get those technologies into into the hands of older adults or or benefiting older adults. So uh, that's something we're looking to continue to build on and finding ways to support some of these partners in how uh, technology can actually be beneficial, but not just beneficial in, in pilots, something Canada is known for, but to uh, to be reproducible and scalable. So a lot of our focus has been fo on that, but uh, more recently we've also uh, received some additional support to uh, build out our Healthy Aging Canada program, which will involve supporting uh, research into healthy aging, um, as well as uh, focusing a little bit more on uh, commercialization and, and impact in that space. Uh, so for us, we're a network. We we believe in uh, creating the right connections between necessary stakeholders and almost acting as a convener oftentimes for those in industry and, and academia, as well as uh, those in the community and government to kind of bring them to table and have them working together in, in the same direction. And uh, we feel that when that does work well and people have the right intentions, it can lead to um, greater benefits uh, but it's something that still needs i think uh, a lot of work even even here where we're involved so that's what we're at and what we're focused on 
And what would you say would be your priorities, Michael, in terms of, from, of what other people have said in terms of, you know, that, that itch that still needs scratching in, in Canada around ageing, what would it be, do you think, given your breadth? Yeah, uh, I mean, for us, I think our, our priority will be to increase the engagement of, of industry um, on the one hand uh, in the space, especially since we're dealing a lot with technology and where it's useful. Um, but also to uh, create, find ways to to create ways for those who are actually serving older adults, whether it's it's those in senior living or long term care or home care, uh, and I know these are called different things in different places. Uh, but basically, finding ways to support them who are oftentimes under resourced in uh, having better ways to understand where technology can be useful and uh, almost supporting them to implement it, because we have been. Oftentimes, hearing from our partners that implementation is a major struggle for them. Uh, they can sometimes test out technologies, but as much as they want to, they don't have the knowledge or capacity to implement it, but they are open to working with others to support them. So our priority will be to find ways to support them in that, uh, you know, even as we continue to fund research and look at healthy aging broadly, we want to make sure that real world impact is, is uh, done quickly and done more frequently. Helpful, very, very helpful, Michael. Thank you for that. And common issues there, I know, across in Scotland, Australia as well. Andy Miller, we've saved you to last. The best. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, all right, thanks for having me, everyone. I'm not sure I have a whole bunch to add. I think Rick and Charlotte did a great job sort of summarizing what we're focused on. Uh, what I will say is, you know, ARP is so large. We have so many uh, social impact or issue areas that we focus on. And, and the HSAC Collaborative is really focused on trying to work across those areas. That being said, we do have certain things that uh, each year will resonate more than others. Uh, it seems like 2024 is going to be really a heavy focus on brain health uh, for us. Uh, we always talk about social engagement uh, or social isolation, however you want to look at it. Um, and, and what we've been terming or we're now terming smart living. Right. So, uh, you know, we had a pretty big push at CES this year to try and bring together really around a digital health, but aging in place kind of concept. And, and uh, we're going to start now thinking about it in terms of less of smart home, um, more of smart living, if that makes sense to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, as we march towards next year, uh, next year at CES, uh, CTA is moving the entire digital health uh, category around us over at the Venetian. So knowing that's coming, we have been really focused on, or we are going to focus on this idea of smart living. We are working with our friends from, from Samsung again, Samsung health, probably again, um, and trying to figure out what does that look like and how do we start to define, uh, this category? It's not about just aging in place. It's about living and thriving and all these things. So mm. that'll be one of the focuses. The other thing um, you know, as Rick mentioned, we're we're trying to just grow this as much as we can. Uh, his team is doing a great job. I think we're almost 400 companies now. Uh, and, and, and it's really around that convening piece. So while we may have issues we care about uh, in digital health and other areas, uh, sometimes that takes a little bit of a backseat to this idea of the ecosystem being this mechanism to convene. So as we bring more and more of the large companies on, and we've got some of the largest in the world now that have joined, as we learn what they're interested in, a lot of the, the collaborative itself may be focused on trying to um, convene in, in, in I, I call it the not so serendipitous serendipity, right? Like how do we behind the scenes hamster wheel and get people connected that we know need to be connected? Uh, uh, that said, um, we are seeing the, the original value prop of the HSEC Collaborative was big company investor meet startup. And we are seeing now, while that's still the primary driver, we are seeing big companies want to play with big companies. So there's a little bit of that that's new for us as well. Uh, and then we're also going to be looking at how do we sort of potentially prop up or create a new ecosystem for investors. Okay, helpful. Now we're we're Sophie's dropped off. 
Um, so she's going to come she back. She's she coming said. back, Andy. Yeah. So I think we can give her a chance in a minute. Yeah. And I know Nicole's on the call, so maybe if she's got the scope to talk, I don't know whether she's. Uh, yeah, I know she said she was in call. Nicole. Nicole, she might be tied up on other calls. Yes. Yeah. Feedback from you, John. Before, well, whilst we're waiting for Sophie. Cause... So I, yeah, I thought that was um, really good, and we'll talk about some of the forward logistics in a minute. I, I wanted to just put up a couple of other areas that either were mentioned lightly or perhaps not at all. I, I think I was glad to hear a couple of people talk about prevention. I think that's a big bucket. And I think we could spend some time thinking about that. You know, we we talked a little about our lifestyle and the rest of it, but then you know, there's all the preventive activities we can get up to. You know, physical activity, nutrition, food as medicine, better sleep, better stress management. Um, that could be a whole emphasis area in and of itself. Um, in terms of what do we really mean by prevention, and at what stage do we have to start? I often think about all those public health programs on cleaning our teeth or our they would all fall out of our head that our parents gave us can we do that really across the the entire continuum so that's one i think another one we touched on but we could go further is this sort of whole person care that leaks for me into precision medicine and personalized medicine so i think that's a whole topic and then that gets us into you know should we be getting into the genetic predispositions um, and other things that might impact on that as part of what we discuss we discuss um, we didn't talk much about chronic disease management, and I did say at the outset, you know, I think the, the idea was uh, to try and get to the prevention side more than anything else, but it's hard to ignore. So is there an emphasis in healthy aging here it was how do you thrive in the uh, circumstance of having what might be even multiple chronic diseases? Again, I'd, I'd be interested in um, in feedback. And then lastly, uh, I think there's a whole area around uh, education and awareness. So it's not just digital literary and digital e uh, and then uh, equity, health equity. Um, it's it's education and awareness on both sides of the fence. It's is our, are our systems well enough aware of older adults and their needs? I often think they're, you know, the 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 information about them can be thin. Um, and then equally, are those older adults aware of the optionality that's available to them to thrive more effectively? And are we are we providing those channels? So those would be my my contributions to the debate. Helpful, helpful. Lennon, any comments from you? No, I'm very much in listening mode. Not my area of expertise, I'm afraid. What's what's reassuring from today's call so far is there's there's been some. As, as John said, some, some, some very clear messages from finance from around the globe, but also clear priorities that we can use that ecosystem model that we use elsewhere to say, OK, whether it's on, on, the, on the brain health piece or prevention, what's the need? And then what does good look like? And where can we share best practice? And lastly, where can we collaborate? Because those, those, those three things go hand in hand, not just the learning from best practice, but actually where can we actually do something? collaboratively uh, across the country and I think that you know there's, there's, there's clear evidence of that's happening already uh, with some of our clusters our healthy aging clusters whether it be um, in in, uh, in Canada or Australia or indeed colleagues who couldn't join today from Spain from from uh, Castile Leon where they've got these healthy aging clusters baked in as they do in France as well where can we learn and share best practice about working with companies in that so you know, we could pick any number of these priorities that you've highlighted for us and use that model to bring in need, policy need, research needs, but also needs for patients and citizens and their carers. Because that's that's that first piece that we always try and address with our ecosystem model. And then where where we've got that practice of what good looks like is how we can bring those silos together to collaborate with those those specific needs we've highlighted. So that's the model in which we would use to target some of these priorities. Mm -hmm. Any other comments from people who've, who've you know talked already but heard things that actually sparked a bit of interest? Uh, Andy, before we have the more open debate, can we just talk about how this will pan out after February? Because we do have uh, a much bigger group potential. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, some of you may know other people that should be in on this conversation, right? You've all got your own sort of you know network ties. 
uh, they've either got best practice themselves or are interested in that, whether they come from the investment side or patient advocacy or government, wherever it might be. Um, I think one of the idle thoughts we've got is this may well not meet as a single group, potentially four times a year, but in its time zone. So North America and, you know, Central and South America, Europe and Africa, and then maybe Asia. Mm. We can handle a time frame, frame rather better and then maybe an annual meeting that pulls all of those threads together. Mm. And of course, that allows us to have a sort of, you know, a, a focus or a theme that's slightly different uh, in each of those conversations. Mm. Let's say each of them have three major topics that are all different. That means we're tackling in a, in a one year time frame, you know, nine different topics and reporting back on that mm. as a group. And that's what ECH pulls together, coordinates, reports upon, you know, on behalf of the uh, the thematic ecosystem. But um, you run those, Andy, so you might want to just share with the group how they typically operate, what's re what's expected, and then we'll open up the conversation. Yeah, I think I'll give you an example, which is involved colleagues from Australian Demo. We, we set out to tackle a not small area around digital health skills. And the way we did that was different than, than perhaps sometimes is focused upon but very often the, the priority is, oh, we need to skill up already very well-skilled professionals towards the end of their career who are, you know, eminently well-paid surgeons, et cetera. We actually were flipped it on his head and say, well, we, we keep this from a European perspective and brought in Australian perspective to say, where do we target first? And we targeted there of skills around patients and citizens first then caregivers, then frontline staff, then managers, then health care informatics specialists, et cetera, and, and, and more, more topics still to come. But the approach was, again, quite basic. What is, what's the need in, and, and we approach this from Denmark and Australia to start off with, what's the need in Denmark around uh, assessing uh, the, the skills level of uh, citizens to use digital health products we expect them to use? How do you actually go about assess, making assessments of that? But also then what what does the, what did, what was happening in Australia around building a curriculum um, around digital health skills? But bringing that that res, re, response in allowed us to then bring in best practice from not only Australia and Denmark, but also then across Europe, Africa and India to showcase what they were doing in terms of multiple MOOC learning, micro learning, et cetera, to teach people skills at a what much wider level. That approach of bringing need and solution enabled us to then identify opportunities for countries to collaborate together, whether it be on funding programs or collaborative pieces of research, or indeed on, on exchange of ideas and arranging learning expeditions between them to try and exchange ideas. So there's actually actual collaborative pieces of work that took place as a result of those. So that model then, morphed from from looking at citizens to carers carers to frontline staff the same approach what does the need what does good look like and that enabled us to, to to cover topic by topic across the area of skills rather than trying to do everything at once but by small subtopic bringing across a global response on the area of digital health skills that's online it was it was obviously virtual because trying to get you know, just trying to bring in um, Australian and, and, and Danish time zones together was like herding cats, as you can imagine. So we had to make sure that could happen virtually, but also at time zones that can make it possible for getting engagement from India and Africa. The missing piece here all the time, though, as, as we've learned from today, was then how do we include the US and America time zones as well that were missing. So very much as John said, we're going to have to think about perhaps doing smaller maybe wider regional pieces that are a bit less time sensitive. There's a reason we've not got colleagues from Africa, et cetera, here today in India, because they've been fast asleep, hopefully. They've got any sense for at least a couple of hours already. Blenin, I see you've got a hand up. Yeah, so I'm just thinking that I don't think it's a one size fits all in terms of is it uh, time zone meetings? Is it virtual meetings? Um, I would have, I'm hoping that one of the real advantages for everyone involved is being, is to be able to share lessons learned from different countries 
and that might mean that that needs to be done uh, in person or virtually or perhaps by just swapping uh, reports and information uh, and things that have been done Equ equally it may be that a lot of working can take place um, electronically effectively and and i think this is for the group uh, once it starts to be formed and work to think about so how best do people want to tackle some of these issues so once it becomes clear what the focus is in the first year then i think the way that we work will become clearer mm -hmm. yeah it's a fair comment yeah charlotte yeah. um <clears throat> i just wanted to in this is just a small example i just wanted to build on john's comment about prevention and dandy your comment about small actionable um, so it may be that some of the starting points could be things that there are solutions right now. We don't have to build and start. So I'm going to give you one very clear example, hearing loss. We now know that hearing loss is hugely prevalent. Two thirds of people 70 and older have significant hearing loss. And we know it is tied to dementia, it is tied to falls, it is mm -hmm. tied to depression, it's also mm -hmm. tied to higher healthcare costs, higher utilization, higher caregiving needs, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there's a lot of in social um, isolation, loneliness, et cetera. Now, what's so cool about hearing loss, it's hugely prevalent. Mm -hmm. It's measurable, right? You get a hearing test, there are people talking about hearing number, it's monitored, it's able to be monitored, it's measured. You know, they're actually standards for hearing loss. Number three, we now have solutions. There are hearing aids, there's captioning, there is um, AuraCast, which um, now can make, um, you know, with Bluetooth standards, can make hearing now mainstream. Um, there are solutions that are already out there now. Now, maybe they need to be vetted, you know, in terms of what's better, but Here's something that can, might impact dementia, quality of life and living, lifestyle, um, healthcare outcomes, cost of healthcare that is measurable with solutions. And that's a huge number. Now, maybe we can find more examples like this mm -hmm. that we can rally around that actually can cut across the globe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right, Charlotte. Can I add a couple of things, Andy, to what Charlotte said? Because mm -hmm. she mentioned a couple of things that are jumping off points. Charlotte, I couldn't agree more that I think there are known problems and we're looking for best practice, um, whether it's, you know, as, as I sit in the States, as you do, um, you know, can it be inbound to us or have we got the best practice and it can be outbound to others who've got the same problem? I think there are also gaps um, where there are no solutions. And I think that's another really good focus for the group. You know, where is there nothing and yet there's need? Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day um, in another area, which is declining eyesight, which I know is a favorite of yours as well. Um, and was talking about just the issue of glare at night, which stops people driving way too early because they just become, they lack um, comfort. Uh, I know the French government have done a ton of work on this. It's why you see yellow headlights in France to reduce the glare effect, for example. Um, so, you know, it's those sorts of areas. I think the one I would quote as an example, if I can just use another Australian one, sorry to keep overdosing on the Australians here for best practice, but um, it's another goodie, I think. Uh, social isolation and loneliness, Charlotte mentioned, massive issue all over the world, all ages. But in the older population, a lot of it is around men, um, men, men north of 50, uh, men post-divorce, for example, um, tend to go and keep the stiff upper lip, as the Brits would say, and uh, just suck it up. The Australians found that the start of the whole shed movement, um, the whole idea being if I'm insulting to all the men in this group, um, men are like children. You need to go and get them to play nice together. Best way to do that is get them in a shed, get them with some tools and some crafts. And even though they go in there with their arms folded across their chest thinking, well, this is not for me. It takes all of about 20 minutes before they're talking to each other through the, that, that whole environment of being in a shed and making something out of woodwork or whatever it is. It, and that's got such high efficacy uh, as an approach. Why is not not elsewhere? So we might think, well, that's got to have some adaptation uh, elsewhere in the world. But it's a good example of what Charlotte's talking around, around hearing um, in a similar way. And then we're tackling socialization and loneliness as an issue. Um, so and that, 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 that example, I can remember bringing that into the UK 
in the city I worked in and then having it stolen, stolen from me uh, by the Germans who then went and did their <laughs> version. So I, I thought it was, it was fantastic. I mean, Only the Brits could say stolen by the Germans. <laughs> You've got to get over it, Andy. But a, but a brilliant concept because it worked. And, 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 and I remember just being completely shocked uh, to go and meet a very, very grumpy group of, of, of men who were at least a year older than me, I have to say, at least a year, probably even less. But but the work that was going on there in terms of bringing people back into um, connect, making connections in their community and with each other was A, cheap, B, it worked and was measurable. Again, a little bit like you said, Sean, with the with the hearing hearing loss uh, solutions. So, very good. <laughs> yes. I like the comments in the chat. Nice one, Blevins. Still good ideas with pride. Your chin up. I like that. And uh, yes, George, I do see Australia as Nirvana. Um, <laughs> so I tell you. <laughs> Any other comments coming coming in from Scott? I've not heard from you since the beginning. What? Uh, obviously, you 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 went. You were forced to go first, but then you've been able to. Have a... <laughs> um, I love the conversation, and what I really appreciate is the desire to create action that is making an impact as opposed to just highlighting the areas of need, talking about it, because that happens so much in what we do. Mm -hmm. um, but having some tangible next steps that can demonstrate progress and efficacy is, is something that's hugely important, uh, especially to me. So I, I'm just excited to work with any and all of you um, in, in any way you see fit. Um, I, I think about the, the number of lives that the people on this call touch both directly and indirectly, and it is more than enough to move the needle in meaningful ways around the world. Um, and that's really cool. That is cool. Thanks for that, Scott. Now I'm just. Andy, just, poor just, old yeah. Sophie probably heard Scott speaking when she left the call yeah. to go. And he's, to he's not stopped, stopped since, she, since she left. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so much to say. Over to you, Sophie. I'm so sorry. I had to step out, and I'm happy this is being recorded, so I don't miss anything. Uh, I really didn't know exactly what, what this was. I mean, I saw the email, but it's phenomenal to see this group of people, and thank you, Andy and John, for bringing us together. I'm Sophie Bergqvist, president at Center for Care Innovations, and what we do is... <clears throat> we spark seed and spread innovations for and with historically underinvested communities in the US. So our main partner and really our main asset is safety net providers, feder federally qualified healthcare centers and public hospitals. Deep work in California and Colorado, but also across the country. Um, we, you can almost see us as a chief technology officer for these healthcare providers that don't have that in-house. We help them with big emphasis on defining the problem with the community. So in the case of elderly, supporting them to have the, the confidence and the tools to define the problem with the elderly and then look at what are the solutions out there. So a lot of the things that have come up during the little I was on the call earlier around shared platforms, shared resources, we are all about partnerships, not duplicating, but leaning in. Uh, we've been around for more than 20 years and over the last 15 years been doing, doing really the work around spark seed and spread innovations. Um, we don't only work with elderly, we work for health equity. So within that, most of our programs are engaging elderly and more and more so, and we want to lean in more, but it's not that we only work with elderly. Um, of course, all, most of the work we do in rural areas around virtual care, extensive work for elderly. We've done work around loneliness and so forth, but we are just about to launch our strategy externally and digital transformation for health equity is something we're leading with. So it's on topic here. Developing shared platforms is part of that. So I'm just happy to be here and I don't want to take more of your time because it feels like I really want to make sure that we get a sense we, of- we, the next And we've been waiting for you as well, so patiently. So a question for you. What's the itch, and I've asked several people this already, what's the itch? That's still for you not been scratched as, as well as as health equity do you think if we if we could i'd try and turn the gaze to this to the gaze of attention to to this area or that that that, that specific topic is there a topic you've heard so far that you think 
or you've not not heard mentioned so far do you think during so, this call hmm. I, I feel i mean I, I was out for more than 35 yeah. minutes i would feel i i really don't want to be mentioning things that have already been mentioned but i all the one thing i would even if we talk about elderly rem being reminded about the huge diversity and just speaking about elderly is not enough. If we look among the elderly, it's huge inequities among who is that, who's, who is behind that elderly. And there's always going to be people that are left behind being it to address the digital barriers. Uh, so always doing stratification of data when it comes to race, ethnicity, socioeconomic profile. So aging is not enough. We need to hold ourselves accountable for always addressing inequities within each, each age group. Um, and for elderly, that remains as true as any other. I don't know if that came up earlier, but. No, it's, 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 it's important to, because it's, it's first is to try and gain A, what you're doing, but also what you think's missing. And I think that's, that's a, a key element we've seen elsewhere that that, that, that element is, is, is still missing in terms of health equity. John, any other feedback from yourself? I'd like just to go and throw it over to the rest of the group, Andy. I mean, what I'm going to do for all of you, and I'll work with Andy on this, is I've taken notes of what everybody said. I'll try and turn that into a coherent list uh, so that at least it's a long list of items. I think we can then start to think about what priorities look like. Mm. And if we were to split them up into different time zones, how we might discuss some of those. Um, you can also communicate after this meeting where you think, you know, there was an issue that we should have spent more time on, or maybe it came up in conversation later on, um, as we did with hearing and we did with uh, social isolation, loneliness, for example, as a topic area, or even what Sophie said um, with stratification of data. Um, but, you know, I, 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 you know, we're not trying to force anything here. As I said, this is a meeting of exploration. So has anybody got anything more generally about even how we run this group? I mean, this is an attempt to create a true international multi-country input mm -hmm to be, either servicing best practice, spreading best practice, or finding gaps where no one is really solving for something which is nonetheless a critical problem. So any thoughts, welcome on that subject. Margaret, get your hand up. Sorry, <laughs> just trying to... Um unmute myself there. No, it's been really interesting just hearing the contributions and examples. And I guess I've been a bit thoughtful just about scope because, you know, when we talk about healthy aging, um, you know, it is vast. And, you know, some of the comments made were not just about people who are currently of the older age, but, you know, people in their 40s and 50s and how you can focus on more of that prevention and, um, yeah, I suppose planning, planning to to be as well as you can. So I suppose if we're to look at some of the practical examples, and I really like that focus on, you know, where do we have some examples of what's already sort of impacting? Where do we have gaps? And maybe having some thematic focus, um, because I think there is so much that, you know, we can have a fantastic broad conversation and lots of ideas but if we maybe focus down on on some specific areas and maybe identify some real practical examples as well where we can look at that shared learning i'm particularly interested in some of the you know experiences people have about that adoption you know because we're not short of some we're not we're not short of innovation we do need more innovation but we do seem to have that gap in moving innovation into sort of business as usual or you know as part of uh, mainstream services um, and approaches so I guess you know what what is what, what have been some of the experiences um, other areas have had in terms of how we support that so I think there's so much so much and and, and it's really great to hear um, but I guess going forward do we want to focus maybe on some particular you know practical examples or areas that we could have a bit of a deeper dive on. That's helpful. Helpful. We'll take note of that. I think just for those people who are unaware of how we've done these in the past, typically we pick a top, you know, pick a date and pick a topic um, and try and engage as many people as we can. It might be with the time zone issues, um, not always uh, possible for all to physically take part. However, one of the beauties we've learned over the pandemic period is, is that we can jump in on a video call 
um, and record and pre-record and also record the whole thing so that collaboration piece can still take part after the event. And I think that's one not to be dismissed because you can't do that in a physical place, in a face-to-face -face place. I didn't go to the event in Los Angeles, et cetera, but uh, I want to follow up with the people that were there. You, but, but you can with the digital piece. So I think we've got that ability to be able to convene people, not necessarily all necessarily at the same time, but to bring in that best practice that you've all described. But let him. You're on um, mute. Evan. Sorry, a couple of suggestions uh, for uh, John and, and you, Andy. Um, I, I think it might be interesting if when we're, we're when the people on the call think um, of some like top five things, either top five materials or content that they can share relevant to the conversation that's just been taking place. Um, top five things that each organization is currently working on. Um, the, the top five innovations, which were the, I think the examples that, that were being talked about and the sort of top five missing solutions or needs just to see. I mean, I know from my time in the Department of Health, um, they used to be said, oh, it's on the website, but actually trying to find stuff um, so even practically just being aware of who's got great content and Charlotte was starting to talk about the three P's and the mm. whole approach, changing the conversation about aging, um, that sort of research and, and the knowledge that they have. And we know from the UN event that we held that Saga have that sort of information, I think, being available to other organizations is in, could be incredibly valuable. So, Blethyn, just to add to that a little bit, I mean, there's stuff going on in the chat we can all see, but I think what are we trying to achieve with the populations that we serve? Because we all solve older adults in different ways, if I generalize and call that the 50 plus conversation. So Sophie, just for example, said, you know, I'm thinking about digital formularies, you know, what tools out there are age friendly? Well, Charlotte and I know that ARP have been working on that for the last year and a half as well. So what a wonderful opportunity just in this small group right now to go and say that if that gets elevated to an important issue, we all want age-friendly tech and innovation. Um, maybe there's a small group of people that work on that. So I, I think, Blevin, that's where your kind of top five things you're working on and top five gaps might be really helpful, even in this uh, exploratory group. And we're happy to convene that as well and share that afterwards if people want to do that afterwards and come back to us. Sure. I mean, there's stuff around the venture community and getting more investment into the space. Um, you know, that whole pre-50 stuff. What are we what are we doing? I mean, back to my teeth cleaning example. I'm pretty sure my parents told me that message when I was five. So healthy aging clearly starts at five as my milk teeth dropped out. So is that what we have to be doing? You know, prepping people. Do we have to be in schools doing more education? Should health be higher on the curriculum? And I'm just inventing to illustrate. We mm. really get the scope at this stage to go and decide what we want to talk about so that we're not just affecting the short term, but the medium term and the long term as well. Um, so. Mind you, as long as you don't perpetrate the, the, the lies I was told when I was a child, that if you read late at night, it would damage your eyes. I was yeah. lying to. Hey, that was just you, Andy. Just you. Any other comments? Or just thoughts in general. I'd I'd like to know who's going to be at Vibe of the people that are left still, mm -hmm. um, because there's we are going to be having an event. Healthy Agent will be a theme at Vibe for us on the Sunday afternoon, the very first day of the conference. So anybody who is going to there, please come along to the ECH event. It's right on the uh, the agenda. Um, and we'll at least formally launch this. And then our attempt will be to widen the group also. And everyone in it will have a stake in um, older adult innovation uh, in general. That's the thinking. But um, and, and for those who aren't going to be at Los Angeles at Vibe, and, and uh, old enough to remember a live aid, simultaneously, we will be launching this in Barcelona during Mobile World Congress, um, during yep. our digital health and wellness. And so if you're coming over to Barcelona for Mobile World Congress, come and see us there, because we'll be also be doing it live, in person, uh, without Phil Collins, I have to say, uh, at yeah. a pop stars, but we'll be doing it in person in Barcelona during our Digital yeah. Health and Wellness. And so if you're interested, if you're in one place, go to Vive. If 
you're in Europe, please come along to mobile. We'll and, and Mandy, it will remain a theme. I mean, as we go forward with other conferences, we'll go to. I think it'll. This will yeah. remain a theme for us going forward. Um, but I, you know, I think we're trying to go and capture the, um, you know, the early, you know, running order. Really, the kind of menu of things that we want to talk about, just so we know we've got commonality around those themes and those issues. Um, um, so, and I know yeah. health, healthy aging innovation cluster in Scotland also have one of their ecosystem sessions coming up shortly in in February, if I'm not mistaken. Margaret, is that correct? Yeah, it's the 26th of February. Actually, this one is in, in person, but I think it's going to be, uh, I'll double check if it's going to be sort of live streamed as well. But uh, I mean, a lot of them are virtual, but this one is going to be an in-person one on the 26th of February. But I'll I'll maybe put something out to you, Andy, that you can circulate if it yep. is going yep. to be available for people to join virtually. And the same with others on the call too, if you're involved with that. As George was saying, the you know, with with, with um, sorry, as as, as Sean was saying with Andy with CES or George at the Hour of Health event, you just come from. It's important we share some of these up opportunities and events as well. So, these are yeah. great places to make connections and and learn from others too. Yeah. Um, and we've already heard. I know Andy Miller's left, but uh, Rick, you're still around. I mean, what was that? Twenty four thousand square feet at uh, CES, and you're going to do a land grab for the whole of the Venetian now. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it felt like 24. It wasn't quite wasn't quite that. Um, uh, but you know, each year we we um we need more space because we want to bring more companies and we want to show up bigger. So uh yeah, next year we'll be and we'll be at five and we'll be at health and uh we've got our own conference happening in the fall and there's others throughout the year where we'll be yeah. attending. Yeah. And my thought of I was going to say, Andy, that's something as a group, you know, I mean, there's a number of best practice and innovation centered mm -hmm. conferences and get together some private some public. That's something this group can start paying attention to and curating, um, particularly for their quality, because my experience is they vary greatly. And and I and also throw into the mix as well, the mapping that happens in various countries. And Michael, I know you do that within within Canada with the age well uh, collaborative there to, to map out some of that best practice too, as well as invaluable too. So we can help collate and convene and share that too um, from our network outwards and backwards. That would be, be very, very helpful. Yeah. Well, your opportunities are there. We will come back to you. John and I will, will put our heads together and, and uh, compare many of, uh, of the notes I've, I've certainly taken. I know John has as well. Please feel free to reach out to me if you think, and I should have raised this this um, this piece of work we're going to be involved with, whether it's you, Ted, or 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 Scott, or um, or even Sue over to Australia. You think, okay, I'd like to be able to share this wider. Please feel free. Just email me. My email address is, is andy at echlines.com. It's at the top of the chat, but um, you all have my contacts on today for coming along. I'd be more than happy to share that from today and add that to the resources we've got. Similarly, I know the people who couldn't attend uh, uh, have also got input they want to bring in as well because for, for other reasons we're, we're, we're unable to attend. And so then, Andy, we'll circulate this recording. Yeah. We'll be back yeah. in contact on email and particularly after this is launched at Vive, there'll be, uh, you know, we'll be foreshadowing another date and, and how we want to run this at a logistical level. Is that, is that I'm, right? I'd, I'd like to thank you all for your time and your contributions. It's been uh, a good start, uh, and and I'd love to meet one of you. Some well, of thank you for time. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very right. much, John. Bye. Let me just grab you before we go. Thanks for that. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.